Okay, welcome back. Tonight we're gonna to start a new unit. We're gonna talk about energy. We're gonna talk about the topic of thermochemistry. We are going to go a little more in depth than we did in Chem 1A about the topic of entropy. And we're gonna talk about free energy and the relationship of energy and equilibrium. So please uh, have your notes ready. Now tonight, a lot of what I'm gonna do is gonna be reviewing stuff from Chem 1A, but I'm gonna help myself with some videos because I feel like sometimes pictures uh, and well done animations sometimes explain things better. I think especially with our generation being the video generation, right? Uh, but I will be writing some stuff, uh, so get ready to write, okay? So let's go here to our PowerPoint. There we go. All right, so hopefully everybody can see this. We are talking about entropy, free energy, and equilibrium, although those three topics actually we'll introduce them on uh, in our next lecture on Thursday. So it may be that tonight's session will be a little uh, slow, uh, short. It all depends on how well I can write. All right, so here are the three questions that we asked on the first day of classes. Number one, will a chemical reaction take place? Two, if it does, how fast will it go? Three, when will it stop? So far, we have covered two of these questions. How fast will a reaction go? Well, that's in the realm of chemical kinetics, our first unit in the course. When will it stop? Well, what we found is that the majority of reactions don't actually stop. They essentially arrive at chemical equilibrium. And we've been talking about that for quite a while now, and we've seen it in different kinds of situations. So it's time to tackle the first question. Will a chemical reaction take place? Can we make even a prediction as to whether something's gonna happen or not? And this is gonna come in the realm of thermodynamics. That is the topic of the moment. We're gonna spend uh, the next week and a half talking about thermodynamics. And next week, we're gonna have a lab activity where you're gonna be uh, once more receiving some data and doing some calculations and uploading a lab report, all right? Although, oh, you know, I was gonna say no graphs this time. Take it back, you are gonna have to do a graph. All right, no problem. You guys are becoming experts now doing graphs, right? Okay, let's uh, start out by asking about physical and chemical processes and is are they spontaneous so for example there are certain things that are by logic by experience spontaneous i mean you ski downhill you don't ski uphill right but let's talk about some less trivial examples here right for example a waterfall runs downhill right it, it flows in favor of gravity a hot cup of coffee will get cold if left on the table. Speaking of which, mine's not even here on my table. I have a glass of water and that's it. But anyway, you get, you get what I mean, right? At one atmosphere, I'm getting technical here, one atmosphere, water freezes below zero degrees Celsius and ice melts above zero degrees Celsius. In other words, if I have a glass with water and ice sitting at room temperature, what's gonna happen is the water is gonna stay liquid, but the ice is gonna melt and that is a spontaneous process. Heat flows from a hotter object to a colder object. And we thank that because thanks to that process, we can cook our foods on the stove, yes. A gas expands in an evacuated bulb. All right, that might not be as obvious because I don't think you guys uh, experience that on a daily basis. And let's look at this one. Iron exposed to oxygen and water forms rust. So these are all processes that either from experience or from a little bit of logic and thinking, we can tell these are spontaneous. They just happen. Now, there are situations where you look at the scenario and you might not have enough information to tell whether a process is spontaneous or not. For example, if I look at a chemical equation that I'm not familiar with, I might not have the information I need to decide if that reaction is spontaneous or not, right? 
Now, why is this all important? Well, it's important for the following reasons. You got to remember that chemistry ultimately is about either finding out what things are made of or making things that were not there before, right? So you've got to understand processes. And for example, you would like to know if a proposed procedure for making a compound is going to work or not, because it may be that the process just doesn't work. Or second, let's say you've made a compound. Well, you would like to know if that compound is going to decompose, if it's going to degrade, if it's going to fall apart. And if, the, and if so, you know, what's that like? Or number three, I mean, perhaps let's go a little deeper than that, uh, biological processes. As you know, I'm, I'm a biochemist, so that's kind of like the area that I really like a lot in chemistry. So I would like to know if there's any process that I'm interested in that goes uh, on inside a cell. Is that process spontaneous? And I realize that as I'm talking about these things, we are using this word spontaneous, but I'm not sure that we're defining it. So let's go ahead and get a definition for what we mean for something being spontaneous. What do we mean by that? So here's what we mean. It's a process that once started and under a given set of conditions will occur and continue on its own. So number one, Spontaneous doesn't mean that it happens all by itself. There has to be a start. There has to be a, I don't know, like a kick in. There has to be a, you know, a jump ball to get the game started. Some event has to happen, but once it starts, the process can continue without any outside intervention. All right, very important. Another important distinction, spontaneous is not the same as instantaneous. So just because a process is spontaneous doesn't mean that we're actually going to see it happen. I mentioned earlier, if you expose iron to moisture and oxygen in the air, it will rust, which is a process of oxidation. We'll study that in the next unit. But it doesn't happen overnight. In other words, if I put my bicycle outside in the patio under the rain, it's not going to I'm not going to wake up the next morning and see it rust. But if we do what my son did several years ago, which was, which was to leave the bicycle outside in the yard for several months, not even remembering that it was out there, and dad goes out, that's me, dad goes out when he's cleaning the yard and finds under the bushes this bicycle, of course, the chains on the bike were all rusted out. It didn't happen instantaneously, but it happened sort of on its own. Once it got started, it kept on going on its own. All right, so that's the difference that we had to keep in mind all the time. For example, ladies, you know that nice little diamond that you might be wearing around your finger? Do you know that the process of converting diamond to charcoal is spontaneous? Yes, it is that diamond will spontaneously change into charcoal. But you know what? It's going to take several million years. So I wouldn't worry about it for now, okay? So that's what I'm saying. It's spontaneous, but it's not instantaneous. The key concept that we're going to tackle tonight and throughout the rest of this unit is the concept of energy. And again, please make sure we understand the definition of energy. Uh, we use it in many different ways. We talk about, oh, the energy crisis, or we talk about alternative forms of energy, or we talk about, oh, you have such negative energy, or we talk about, gosh, why do you feed your kids? They're full of energy. So the word energy has a lot of different connotations in our society. So it'd be good for us to narrow down the definition for the purpose of our class. It is defined as the capacity to perform work or to transfer heat. We're gonna talk about this in more detail later so we can review some of the things that we usually cover in Chem 1A, but I realize that some of you may have forgotten. There are two large categories of energy. Kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion, and potential energy, which is energy that is quote unquote stored. You know, technically potential energy is 
the energy that is due to the position of an object with respect to one of the fundamental forces of nature, for example, uh, uh, gravity or the electromagnetic force, for example, any one of those, all right? Thermodynamics is a scientific study of the interconversion between different kinds of energy. So the important thing with energy is that just like with matter, it is conserved during any process, but you can convert one form of energy into another one. Let's go to the classic example, all right? The classic example of the conservation of energy, sometimes called the first law of thermodynamics. You can convert energy from one form to another, but you cannot create it nor destroy it. All right, so let's look at, I think that's Hoover Dam over the Colorado River. And notice that uh, all of that water is being held at a higher level than the water from the outflow of the Colorado River at the bottom of the dam. That water is sitting at a position that puts it kind of like away from the natural tendency of gravity to pull it down. It has a lot of potential energy. When we open the floodgates, a lot of that water starts falling down because gravity uh, pulls it and the water moves in the favor of gravity. But now that water is moving. It is converting that potential energy that was stored into kinetic energy. How is that useful to us? We should be able to capture because we want to use energy to perform work, to move things, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna intercept the flow of water with a turbine. And as the water flows, it turns the turbine blades, which in turn rotates the uh, rotor here, which generates, uses that motion to generate electrical energy. And now we take that electrical energy and we transport it out so that we can, you know, light up our cities, heat our stoves, warm our houses, uh, everything else that we charge our mobile devices and all that kind of stuff that we do with electricity. Now, remember that what we're trying to do is arrive at a sense of, you know, what is it that determines whether a process is spontaneous or not. So what we're gonna do is eventually we're gonna arrive at the equation. This is going to be the mantra of this unit. And it looks like this, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. <clears throat> what are these things? Okay, so delta G is the change in free energy. And we'll define that later on. Delta H is the change in enthalpy. We'll define that later on. T is the absolute temperature. And delta S is the change in entropy, a property that we're gonna study in our next session. For tonight, we are going to forget about all this. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on this property called enthalpy, delta H, all right? Okay, so let's go ahead and we're gonna move out of this thing here. Back to our presentation here. And Denise S is entropy, entropy. We're gonna discuss it on Thursday in our next session. Okay, thanks for asking. All right, we're gonna go to our makeshift whiteboard here, if you don't mind. So please get some uh, paper and something to write with. We're gonna be talking about some important things here. Now, all of this stuff is stuff that I cover in my, cover in my Chem 1A class, but I realize that not all of you have been fortunate enough to take that class with me, ahem, ahem. <laughs> I'm just joking. No, I think mostly what it is is, you know, we forget these things, all right? We forget these things. So here is where we're gonna start. All right, first of all, let's consider a chemical reaction. Let's say simply reactant A is being converted into product B. And of course, we're gonna balance the equation. We'll have some kind of like 
uh, stoichiometric coefficients in there. Now, what is happening in the reactants? Well, in the reactants, you are having chemical bonds broken, right? Chemical bonds are being broken. What is happening in products? Well, what's happening in products is you are making new chemical bonds. So we'll say that chemical bonds are formed. Now, what is a chemical bond? Remember, a chemical bond is essentially an energy state of electrons between atoms that represents a lower energy or a more stable state than if the atoms were apart. So that means that if I am going to break chemical bonds, I'm essentially gonna have to move electrons and atoms away from each other. In other words, against a stable arrangement that maximizes the attraction forces that made them in the first place. So essentially what's gonna happen here is that energy is gonna be required. You're gonna to have to input energy here to move atoms away. from each other. And again, given the definition of what a chemical bond is, that means that you are moving them against a stable arrangement. that maximizes attraction forces. So that's what's happening. So that means that I have to pump energy in. Now, what about the formation of chemical bonds? Well, like I said, when you form a chemical bond, you are going from a higher to a lower energy state. In other words, in this case, energy is being released as the atoms are moved. I probably could have done a PowerPoint with all this, right? But I don't know, sometimes it helps to follow along at a slower pace. In favor. of a more stable arrangement. Remember that we're saying that when atoms form a bond, their electrons are gonna be in an energy state that maximizes the opportunity for them to interact with the nuclei of the neighboring atoms. And so it kind of goes in favor, right? In other words, maximum attraction. So what is the change of energy that is happening? You know what? I sometimes see it as a um, kind of like a business transaction. You know how you start a business, you pay some costs up front, you buy materials, stuff like that. You have to pay your workers or whatever. And then you get income from your sales and then you check, okay, what is the balance? What is the uh, bottom line, right? It's kind of like saying, well, how much energy is released by the process minus how much energy was uh, invested to start with? And whatever the net of that is tells you what the change in energy was. But there's a problem. We can't measure this. because the energy of chemicals has many different components. And so we don't have a way of actually tracking how much energy is in here, how much energy is in there. So we can't measure this, right? But 
one thing we know, and that is that reactions don't happen in a void. The reaction doesn't happen in a vacuum. So whenever we study energy, what we have to consider is our reaction, we're gonna call that our system, but it's not in a void. There are some surroundings. So for example, a reaction between an acid and a base doesn't occur by itself, there is a solution in which it is happening, right? A combustion doesn't happen by itself. It happens, you know, probably in the presence of air or in an engine or something like that. So there are things around it. And what we actually look at is, what is the energy exchange between the system, in other words, our chemical reaction, and our surroundings. Now remember, in any kind of process, energy is conserved, right? So we have a principle that's very important and it is the conservation of energy, which says that whatever change happens in my system, and whatever change in energy happens in the surroundings has to total zero because energy has to be conserved. Whatever energy my system gives away, the surroundings has to get it. There can be no net change of energy in the universe. Or another way of saying this is the energy change for my system can be equal to the opposite or the negative of the energy change in the surroundings. And the key to thermodynamics is that we can actually calculate this. So if I know what is the energy change in my surroundings, I know that the energy change in my system has the same value, just the opposite sign. All right, so let's go and look at this video that I have here. Now, these videos are actually going to be in our Top Hat page. So when you go there, you'll be able to see these, vid these videos. And they are here in the section of chapter 17 of Top Hat. But I thought I'd watch it, we'll watch it together just in case we have any questions afterwards. Okay, here we go. And you know what? Hold on a second. Let me make sure that our system is prepared here for this. So give me a few moments here. Make sure that when we share this, okay, we got it. Okay, sorry about that, guys. I needed to make sure that I didn't leave you guys without audio. Okay, so let's go ahead and watch this little video. <laughs> Energy is one of those things in science that can be hard to wrap your head around. Energy is the capacity to do work and to make something happen. It's different from matter because it has no mass and it takes up no space. You can really only detect it by its effect. Thermochemistry is the branch of chemistry that studies energy changes that occur during chemical reactions or changes of state. There are two main categories for the different forms of energy. Potential energy and kinetic energy. Potential energy describes a situation where work isn't currently being done, but it could be done under the right situation. 
Chemical energy is the energy that's stored in the bonds of atoms. The kinds of atoms and their arrangements will determine how much energy is stored. Kinetic energy is the form with action. Thermal energy is the internal energy of a substance, which we can't actually measure, but we can calculate the energy when the thermal energy moves. We call that heat. In this lesson, we're going to focus a little on chemical energy and largely on thermal energy and its transfer process called heat. Potential energy is stored in the bonds of this chemical, isooctane, also known as gasoline. When the bonds break, an explosion occurs, which turns the stored chemical energy into kinetic energy in the forms of both movement and heat. The explosion moves the pistons of the engine and thereby the car, and the heat will make the engine hot. Heat is energy that transfers from one object to another because of a temperature difference between them. Heat is represented by the letter Q. Heat always, always flows from the warmer object to the colder object. In the case of a cup of water with ice, the water is warmer than the ice, so the heat will flow from the water to the ice. When we talk about heat, we have to specify two things, our system or item that we're focusing on, and the surroundings with a defined limit. We have to bring things down from the size of the universe to something we can handle. This cat is alive and metabolizing the food that it ate, and it's giving off heat, which goes from the system to the surroundings. The cat is giving away its heat or losing its heat, so we say that the Q is negative. The Q of the surroundings is absorbing the heat that the cat is releasing or gaining heat, so it's positive. The amount of heat released by the cat will be equal to the amount of heat absorbed by the surroundings, which is according to the law of conservation of energy. This fact will become important soon. Now the heat lost or gained could be the other way around, like this. The surroundings give off heat. Imagine the scenario of the ice cube. As it's starting to melt, the ice cube is the system, and the surroundings would include the air and the surface that the cube is on. This time, heat is leaving the surroundings and moving into the ice cube, which causes it to melt. Notice it's not the cold that moves, it's always the heat that moves. This time the Q of the system is positive and the Q of the surroundings is negative. This time the Q of the system is positive and the Q of the surroundings is negative. The examples with the cat and the ice cube are great examples of exothermic and endothermic processes. The cat releases heat into the surroundings, so this is exothermic, which literally translates to out heat. The ice cube, however, absorbs heat from the surroundings, so this is endothermic, which means in heat. Endothermic systems have a positive Q, and exothermic systems have a negative Q. Now it's important to note that heat and temperature are not actually the same thing. Even though we may use the words interchangeably in everyday conversation, heat is the transfer of thermal energy, whereas temperature is the average kinetic energy of a sample of particles. You can't directly measure heat. We don't have heat o -meters. It's just too complicated to calculate every possible source of heat energy in an object, kind of like trying to precisely measure the volume of the ocean. It's just not going to happen. But we can measure temperature with thermometers. The main unit of measurement for heat is the joule or calorie, and for temperature it's Celsius or Kelvin. They really only have one thing in common, and that's that you can use temperature as part of a calculation to find heat. Heat is measured in joules or calories. One joule is the amount of energy to raise one gram of water, 0 0.2390 degrees Celsius. But in food science, we use calories to measure energy. 4.184 joules makes up one calorie with a lowercase c. Interestingly, to raise one gram of water one whole degree Celsius, it takes 4.184 joules. The calorie is based on this information. Now, be careful when you read food labels because you're actually reading a kilocalorie, which is written with a capital letter C. It's a subtlety, but one that's important for us to point out. Every object can be heated up. The amount of heat needed to increase the temperature of an object by exactly one degree Celsius is called heat capacity. Different objects will have different heat capacities based on their mass and chemical composition. So to really account for the mass, we need to use something else called specific heat capacity. This is the amount of heat it takes to raise the temperature of one gram of the substance one degree Celsius. Specific heat capacity is written as a letter C, and it has units of joules per gram degree Celsius. Here are some common substances and their specific heat capacities. 
water has a very high capacity compared to metals like iron. This means that it will require more heat to raise the temperature of water than it does to raise the temperature of iron. This makes sense if you've ever boiled water in an iron pot. Even though the pot will be too hot to touch, the water may only be lukewarm. Let's try calculating specific heat of a substance. 11.7 grams of aluminum increases temperature from 12 degrees Celsius to 24 and a half degrees Celsius with the addition of 132 joules of heat. What's the specific heat? Now specific heat is equal to the heat divided by mass and change in temperature. So we can plug in our data, making sure to subtract the initial temperature from the final temperature. And we'll get C is equal to 0 0.90 joules per gram degrees Celsius for aluminum. Thanks for watching this episode of Teacher's Pet. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow me on Twitter at Science Pet. All right. Hope that was fun. You enjoyed it. We have another one coming up later. But uh, let me see if there's any questions so far about what we've talked about. Anything doesn't jive with things you've learned before or kind of murky. We're going to have uh, some more review in a few moments, but I want to take a break first. Does anybody have any questions? You can either put them on the uh, chat or you can uh, unmute your phone and ask me. No? Okay. Let's have a 10-minute break and we'll reconvene in about 10 minutes. Uh, actually, let's do this. Let's say 544. Let's reconvene at 6 o'clock. Okay? 6 o'clock. We'll take a little sh longer break. All right. We'll see you soon. All right, we are back. Hope everybody's doing fine. Got a little break there. Uh, I didn't see any. I, oh, by the way, we've I've been having some issues with the chat function here in Zoom because when we had the test last week, I had blocked it to allow only individual, like private messaging to myself. And uh, it seems like there's one way of doing that, but then there's like three different or four different knobs to turn or buttons to push to get it back on board so uh if you've been trying to message or something uh maybe that's what happened but you can always uh send me a message uh privately all right okay so uh we talked about energy and heat and let's look at uh some other things here so let's go back to our board here and let me see if this thing is working okay so we're going to talk now about a more mathematical expression of what we've been calling the first law, the conservation of energy. But what we like to do is we like to focus on what happens with our actual system. You notice that the general trend here is that we don't really measure the contents of energy of a system. What we measure is the changes in energy that it undergoes. So let's see, according to the first law, what is the component what are the components of the change in energy of a system and remember a system for us right now is a chemical reaction well remember first of all that this should be the negative of whatever energy changes happen in the surroundings in other words the energy is going to be exchanged between the system and the surroundings. However, there are two ways in which energy can be exchanged. In the video that you just watched, they focused on the concept of heat. Let's talk a little bit about work. So W equals work. You'll notice that we use a small case letter for it. And the reason for that is that work and heat are not what we call functions of state work and heat are exchanged depending on how the process is carried out. They depend on the process. Whereas delta E, the actual change, only depends on what is the final and what are, is the initial energy. So work, if we're gonna define it, is 
this is the energy that is required or used to move things around. I'm going to make it very simple. Move things around. Okay, let me put some quotation marks there so we make sure that that's not a very scientific or categorical statement here. Uh, for example, if you have a reaction that produces a gas, the gas expands and pushes the surroundings out of the way. Uh, so, for example, gas expansion pushes surroundings. So that's an example of work, all right? And we're gonna simplify, we're gonna say that for any process, work is minus P delta V. In other words, the change in volume times the pressure, and this is usually measured at constant pressure because most chemical reactions that we study are carried out at constant pressure. The majority of them we study in the lab, they just have an open container. So it's whatever the pressure of the atmosphere is on that particular day and place, right? Q is the heat. And we're going to define heat, remember, not as energy that substances have, but so, uh, energy that is exchanged between substances. So this is the exchange of thermal energy. Thermal energy being essentially the all of the collection of kinetic energies of all the particles in the system. And the way this happens is essentially, this is due to collisions between the particles of the system and of course, the system and the surroundings. Essentially, imagine you know a pool table, you hit your cue ball, it goes at a certain speed, it's carrying a certain amount of kinetic energy, it hits another ball, it transfers energy to that ball. Some of that energy is work because it moves the other ball, but some of it is lost at, as heat in the friction that occurs between the cue ball and the other ball as heat is transferred. And because most chemical reactions that we study do not produce uh, noticeable expansions of gas, so in most reactions, we're gonna say, that the work performed is nearly zero. In other words, the reaction does not cause a significant uh, change in positions or movement of the surroundings. So therefore, typically in these kinds of cases, the energy change of the system is going to be essentially just heat. I'm gonna put a subscript P here to indicate that it's constant pressure. All right, and therefore, Q of the system is gonna be equal to minus Q of the surroundings. As the video showed, if my system is undergoing an exothermic process, in other words, it releases heat, that heat is gonna be absorbed by the surroundings. Same amount, just opposite signs. And what is important about this is that we have a technique called calorimetry that we're gonna use to measure these heat exchanges between our system and the surroundings. All right. Okay, let's go ahead and move to our next video. We're gonna talk about calorimetry and about some of the uh, energy transactions and how we can study them.
back here in Top Hat. And like I said, these videos are accessible to you, so you'll be able to see them. All right. Uh, once more, let me make sure that we've got the correct settings here. Just a moment, please. Uh, share. Dun, dun. Okay, we got it. Sorry about that. I've had to make sure because I had a problem with these videos yesterday in my Kim 1A class. I want to make sure you guys don't have the same experience here. Okay, here we go. I'm going to move a little bit ahead because the first part of this video is a repeat of what you saw in the previous one. So we're going to start it over here at about four minutes and about 20 seconds or so. Temperature. So as heat increases, temperature increases. This is a direct relationship. If heat is represented by Q and the temperature change is delta T, then when we write our equation, Q and delta T will be on opposite sides of the equal sign. But there's something else that matters about the percolator. What if we had a much bigger percolator? Would the same amount of heat change the temperature the same amount as the small percolator? Because there are more particles that have to get moving faster, it will require more heat to change the temperature the same amount. This means heat and mass are directly related as well. So mass, or m, needs to go on the opposite side of heat. All we have left to consider next is the constant. The object we are monitoring will have a different constant depending on what it's made of. If we're heating up a copper tub, or water, or some other chemical, we would have a different constant. So we use the specific heat capacity, or C, to represent the amount of heat the substance requires to raise one gram, one degree Celsius. The specific heat capacity of water is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. And iron is 0.46 joules per gram degree Celsius. This means that water can absorb a lot more heat before the temperature changes, and iron changes temperature easily when the heat changes. So now we have our equation, Q equals MC delta T, or sometimes I call it Q equals M cat, which is going to be an incredibly handy equation. Let's see a situation where we would use it. Aluminum has a specific heat capacity of 0.902 joules per gram degrees Celsius. How much energy is released when one kilogram of aluminum cools from 35 degrees Celsius to 20 degrees Celsius? We're going to use Q equals MC delta T. The delta T really means the final temperature minus the initial temperature, so we can substitute that information in to the equation. The mass is 1,000 grams. The specific heat is 0.902 joules per gram degree Celsius. The final temperature was 20, so it's 20 minus 35, which will give us a negative number, and that negative is significant. Grams cancel, Celsius cancels. Our final answer is negative 13,500 joules. The negative number means that heat is being released. This is exothermic, and that is consistent with what the problem stated earlier. Calorimetry is the science of measuring heat transfer, and in order to do that, you're going to need a calorimeter. This is a calorimeter. It can be made of really expensive materials and be incredibly efficient at insulation. Or it can be made out of styrofoam cups and do a darn good job of insulation as well. All you need to do this at home is two stacked styrofoam cups, a thermometer, a lid, a stirrer, and a known amount of water. Let's say you have all of this ready to go and you've read the initial temperature of water. Then you take a hot piece of copper at 90 degrees and drop it into the calorimeter. As you stir, you'll see the temperature rise. Eventually, it will stop rising when it's at equilibrium, meaning the water and the copper metal are the same temperature. The heat given off by the metal is absorbed by the surroundings, which includes the water, stirrer, cup, and even the thermometer itself. The majority of the heat will be transferred to the water, and for the sake of simplicity, we'll do calculations assuming that all the heat is actually transferred to the water. But here, I'm being honest. Let's try a calculation to figure out heat transfer with the simple version. An unknown piece of metal weighing 50 grams at 90 degrees Celsius is dropped into a calorimeter that contains 200 grams of 25 degree water. The final temperature of the water is 28.3 degrees Celsius. What is the specific heat capacity of the metal? First, we'll calculate the amount of heat absorbed by the water because we have all the information we need. 200 grams of water, 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius, and the final minus initial temperature. Grams cancel, Celsius cancels, and our answer is 2,760 joules for the water. Because the water could only absorb heat that was released by the metal, we can assume the same amount of heat was released as was absorbed. 
So now we can solve for the specific heat capacity of the unknown metal. So here's our equation, but we want to solve for specific heat capacity. To isolate it, we'll need to divide both sides by m and delta t. The mass canceled, delta t canceled, and here's our cleaned up equation. Now we plug in the data and calculate, and we get 0.9 joules per gram degrees Celsius, which is the specific heat capacity of aluminum. So that was probably a piece of aluminum that was dropped in the calorimeter. The last thing we're going to look at are phase changes and chemical reactions. In this diagram, we have the temperature of water in degrees Celsius on the side and energy added in kilojoules on the bottom. The graph starts by showing ice at a temperature below freezing. As we add heat, the temperature goes up until we get to zero. At zero, even though heat is being added, the temperature isn't changing. This is because the heat is going into changing the phase of water from a solid to a liquid, not into increasing the kinetic energy of the particles. The amount of energy required to either melt or freeze water is 6.01 kilojoules per mole. This is known as the delta H, or enthalpy of fusion. Enthalpy is just heat at a constant pressure. Once all the ice is melted, the heat will raise the temperature of the water until it hits 100 degrees Celsius. This is the boiling point, or vaporization point, of water. Now it will take 40.7 kilojoules per mole of energy to turn the liquid into a vapor. This is the delta H of vaporization. After all the water becomes a vapor, the increased heat will continue to increase the temperature of the vapor. This is also why steam burns are worse than hot water burns. They have a much higher temperature. So how can you calculate all the energy required to go from ice to steam? It just takes a few more steps. Let's try this problem. Calculate the amount of heat necessary to vaporize 125 grams of ice at negative 10 degrees Celsius. So we'll need all of this information. Q equals MPAT, the specific heat of water and ice, and the enthalpy of vaporization and fusion of water. Now let's break down the process. First, we'll calculate the energy needed to warm up the ice to zero degrees Celsius. Since the temperature is changing as we add heat, we'll use Q equals MC delta T. We'll also need the specific heat capacity of ice, which is 2.1 joules per gram degree Celsius. Now we plug in our data. We have the mass of 125 grams, the specific heat, and the final temperature, which was zero, minus the initial temperature of negative 10. Be careful with those double negatives. This creates a positive number. So our Q will be 2,625 joules. We'll save rounding the sig figs until the end. The next step in the diagram is the melting of the ice. Melting ice doesn't change the temperature at all, so we can't use Q equals MCAT. Instead, we'll use the enthalpy of fusion and dimensional analysis. We'll start with the 125 grams of water, we'll multiply by the molar mass of water, and then multiply that by the molar heat of fusion, which gets rid of our grams and moles and leaves us just with kilojoules. So our answer is 41.7 kilojoules, or 41,700 joules. Heating water involves a change in temperature. So this time we'll use Q equals MCAT and the specific heat of liquid water, 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. We'll plug in the mass, the specific heat, and the final temperature, which is 100 minus the initial, in this case, zero, and we'll get 52,300 joules. Finally, we calculate the heat of vaporizing the water with the enthalpy of vaporization and dimensional analysis. Start with 125 grams, we'll multiply by the molar mass of water and the enthalpy of vaporization, and we get 283 kilojoules or 283,000 joules. Lastly, you add the values from each step and you get 380,000 joules or 380 kilojoules. But what does a number like this even mean? Let's put it in terms of something we're more familiar with. Let's talk about calories. There are 4.184 joules for every one calorie. Is that number familiar? It should be. It's the specific heat of water, which makes it nice and easy to remember. But calories with a lowercase c aren't the calories that you see on the back of a food carton. Those are kilocalories, or calories with a capital C. So let's use some dimensional analysis to see how many kilocalories it would take to turn 125 grams of ice into vapor. We start with 380,000 joules, and we'll convert from joules to calories, and then we'll convert from little calories to big calories, which are kilocalories, and we get 91 calories. That's like a quarter cup of guacamole. Hmm, guacamole. Uh, one last thing before I go make some guacamole, let's calculate the heat of reaction of a chemical. The process is really just like calorimetry, but instead of putting some object in water, you'll mix two chemicals together in the calorimeter or dissolve some chemical in water. 
You measure the temperature to its highest or lowest point to get the final temperature. Let's try an example with the molar heat of dissolution. 0.333 moles of a solid was dissolved in 260 milliliters of water at 22.3 degrees Celsius. After the solid had fully dissolved, the final temperature of the solution was 27.5 degrees Celsius. What is the molar heat of solution of the substance? We start this problem just like the unknown metal calorimetry problem. We'll calculate the Q of water first because we have all of the information. Because one milliliter of water is equal to one gram, we can say that there are 260 grams of water. The specific heat of water is 4.184, and the final minus initial is 27.5 minus 22.3. So the heat is 5,700 joules. The water absorbed the heat, which means the reaction gave off heat, so we'll make the reaction itself a negative number. We want to know the heat of the solution in joules per mole. So we have to divide the number of joules by the number of moles, and we get negative 17,000 joules per mole, or negative 17 kilojoules per mole. So this might be potassium chloride dissolved in water. I just looked that up. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Teacher's Pet. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Okay, good. That's a very good video. Like I said, both of those videos we watched today are available in your Top Hat uh, platform. You can just watch them again if you want to. Okay, so uh, let's come back here to our makeshift whiteboard and uh, kind of review what we just talked about here. So essentially, calorimetry is a way of isolating my system, my reaction, and putting in very specific surroundings. And that, surround, that set of surroundings is where we have the calorimeter. Remember, according to the first law, the law of conservation of energy, Q of our reaction plus whatever heat happens in the surroundings has to be equal to zero which means that we don't measure the actual heat that happens with the reaction. We measure based on the temperature change of the surroundings and properties of the surroundings. We calculate what that is. So this would be minus Q of the surroundings. Now, sometimes the surroundings is simply a calorimeter that has been completely calibrated so that we simply measure the change in temperature. And from there, we calculate the heat exchange. So in some cases, like I said, this could be simply uh, the heat capacity of the calorimeter times the temperature change. So in this case, C cal is the heat capacity of the calorimeter. Most combustion reactions or the reactions that are used to establish the uh, food calories that uh, different products have are done this way. The reaction is carried out, the substance is combusted in a calorimeter that's been pre-calibrated to a specific uh, value of the heat capacity. Now, in a solution like the ones that we do, you could also have a two-set reaction. You could have the solution and the calorimeter. So you may have to calculate what is the mass of the solution times the specific heat of the solution times delta T of the solution, and also Although in the example that they gave us in the video, they didn't include this. Technically, you should have a calibration for your calorimeter and a temperature change for the calorimeter. Because technically, when my reaction is happening in there, it is exchanging heat, not only with the solution around it, but also with the inside walls of the calorimeter, the thermometer, and if there's a stir in there also with the stir, and so what we do is we do a calibration where we can find what is the specific, I'm sorry, what is the heat capacity of the calorimeter, okay? 
Let me give you a few seconds to uh, process that. And we're going to go to another paper here. Now, one of the questions that we can raise is, well, if I want to know what is the heat exchange for reactions, do I have to then measure every single reaction in a calorimeter? Some of those, you know, the reaction of an acid of, or a base or the uh, reaction of a metal with acid, things like that, you know, you can do those in the lab, but sometimes we encounter reactions that might not be that easy to handle. And so what we do is we're going to play a trick. All right. Let me pull this down a bit here. This would be item number six. And by the way, I will have all these papers scanned and uh, available to you later on when I put the uh, video of the uh, lecture. Let us define a property. This is something that physical chemists do a lot. They say, let's assume that such and such conditions exist. We're going to call it enthalpy. And we're going to say that enthalpy is the sum of the total energy of the system plus the product of the pressure times the volume. Like I said, we invented this property. So that means that if I have a change in enthalpy, both of these things are going to change. But at constant pressure, the pressure doesn't change. So this will actually be delta E plus P delta V at constant pressure. Now, since we had said that delta E was Q minus plus work, which is minus P delta V, that means that Q equals delta E plus P delta V. Hi, see the similarity there? Let me use my highlighter for that, because that warrants pointing out that is the same as that. In other words, at constant pressure, the heat exchanged by my system is actually the change in enthalpy. Now, this is essentially coming from the uh, net change that happens. Remember that in a chemical reaction, the major thing that is happening is the breaking and the formation of chemical bonds. So this is the net change that has been gained or lost from the breaking and forming of bonds by my chemical reaction. So we could call this delta H or the enthalpy of reaction but we sometimes call it simply the heat of reaction. Because remember, at constant pressure, delta H is actually the heat of the reaction. And it typically we express it in kilojoules per mole. That's the typical units that we use for the heat of reaction. Once more, if delta H of the reaction is positive, we say that the reaction is endothermic. In other words, it is absorbing heat from the surroundings. If the enthalpy of the reaction or heat of reaction is negative, we say that the reaction is exothermic. In other words, it is putting heat out into the surroundings, which means the temperature <coughs> of the surroundings will, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> will increase. Sorry. So let's play with this function called enthalpy. The reason we define it is because H, with a capital H, is a function of state. What does that mean? 
it means that just like, let's say, temperature, pressure, volume, the change in this property depends exclusively on what is the final and the initial state. In other words, the change in enthalpy is simply final minus initial. It's like, for example, let's say you go on a hike and you want to climb a, climb a 2,000 foot hill, right? And you go up there, so you're going to start at sea level and you're gonna end at 2,000 feet. The change in altitude was 2,000 feet. It doesn't matter what trail you took. You might have taken a trail that was like, you know, four miles long. You might have taken a trail that was 10 miles long. The distance you travel does not affect whether the altitude is 2,000 or not. The altitude is just a product of what was the final altitude minus the initial one, 2,000 minus zero. In the same way, the change in enthalpy is a change that only depends on the final and initial states. But if what we're talking about is the heat of a reaction, what is the final state of a reaction? Well, it's the products of the reaction. And what is the initial state? Well, that would be the reactants. In other words, this is independent of the path of the reaction. We may call it, now that we know more about kinetics, the mechanism of the reaction. It doesn't matter whether the reaction takes place in a single step or 10 steps. As long as we have the final and the initial conditions, we can calculate delta H, all right? And so what we're gonna do is, we're going to invent a path for the reaction. We're going to say that we're going to deconstruct the reactants. We're gonna break all of our reactants into elements. And then we're going to take those elements and we're going to build the products from scratch. It's like, for example, let's say my grandson brings me a set of Lego blocks and he has built them into a little shape that looks like a truck. He says, watch up well what I'm going to do. So he takes them all apart, every single block takes them apart, and now he uses the same set of blocks to build now something that looks like a sports car. All of the same Lego blocks are there, but it's a different you know, sample of a vehicle. Same thing here. All of the elements that were present in reactants are present in the products. It's just a different Lego structure. How about that, all right? So that is what, is what we're gonna do. And there is a principle called Hess's Law that says that the heat of a reaction, the enthalpy change of a reaction is the same regardless of the numbers of steps from reactants to products. So remember our path is reactants to products. And much like climbing that 2,000 foot high hill, we just basically choose whichever path we wanna go. The important thing is what is gonna be the altitude at the end? What is gonna be the change in altitude? So the way we're gonna do this, we're gonna make a definition. We're gonna define something called the heat of formation. As a matter of fact, we're gonna call it the standard heat of formation because we're gonna choose conditions for it. This is gonna be called delta H sub F naught. And this is essentially the energy required
to make one mole of a compound from its component elements. There are some conditions to this definition, but I'm not gonna go into those uh, nuances here. For example, the elements are gonna be, have to be in their standard states. So for example, oxygen has to be put in as O2 gas. Fluorine would have to be put as F2 gas. A metal would have to be put in as the neutral element in its most common uh, form and so forth and so forth. But we're gonna skip that discussion for now. So here's what we're gonna do now. Let's write down our uh, equation again. Remember, we started out with the equation that said that we're gonna have m moles of A being converted into n moles of B. And remember, I am gonna build these from scratch, right? I'm gonna build this guy. Well, what does that mean? Well, the change in enthalpy here is going to be, of course, well, what does it take to build one mole of B? Well, that's delta H of formation of B. However, delta H of formation is for one mole. And here I have N moles. So I'm gonna to have to multiply that times N. Where am I gonna build this from? I'm gonna build it from its component elements. Where are those elements gonna come from? Well, they're gonna come from my reactant. I am going to deconstruct this reactant. Now, what would be delta H of that? Well, remember, if the delta H of formation is what it takes to build one mole of the compound, then delta H to deconstruct it would be the negative of the heat of formation of A. But because that's per one mole of A, I had to multiply times the number of moles of A. So essentially, that means that the total delta H of this reaction is going to be minus M times the delta H of formation of A plus N times delta H of formation of B. I know you guys, you don't like having those negative signs in there. So let's go ahead and say this is gonna be N times the heat of formation of B minus M times the heat of formation of A. But remember, this is products, this is reactants. So the all in all here is that if I have a table that lists these values of heats of formation for any given chemical reaction, I can say that this is simply the summation of the delta H's of all the products, of course, everything adjusted by their stoichiometric coefficients, right? Minus the summation of the enthalpies of formation of the reactants. So in other words, I don't need to measure in calorimetry every single chemical reaction. If I have access to this information, I should be all set. Now, certain things are important, okay, some rules. The standard energy of formation of an element in its standard state is zero. In other words, it doesn't cost energy to make an element. We assume we already have the elements. The other one is that 
the energy of formation of a compound depends on the physical state. So when you write your equation, you have to make sure whether you're specifying, okay, is it a solid, is it a liquid, is it a gas, is it in an aqueous solution? The physical state is important. Uh, where can we find this kind of information? Well, let me show you here. If you go to your top hat again, uh, remember that we have this uh, appendix, right? Down at the bottom here of the text, these are these appendices. And one of them, I believe is number four, has a list of thermodynamic state functions. So if you click that, it's gonna open to a table that shows you all of these compounds pretty much in alphabetical order. And the first column tells you what is the standard heat of formation in kilojoules per mole. These other values, delta G and S, we're gonna talk about those uh, next time, okay? Excellent. So that's where you're gonna find that information. Now, I am going to be giving you, I'm gonna be posting this uh, exercise. And let's see if I can find it here. I can't seem to be able to, oh, here it is, sorry. This is gonna be posted. I still haven't decided how I'm gonna put it. So you know what? I might just send out an announcement tonight and put it in as, a, as an attached file so you can download it. And I would really uh, encourage you to work on it between today and Thursday. So, because uh, next time we meet, I'm gonna have an optional session after the lecture where we can go over this in case you have any questions or anything's you know, not clear. I did not cover everything that's in here because a lot of this stuff you should have studied in uh, Chem 1A. And so you should know the difference between a styrofoam cup calorimeter and a bomb calorimeter. You know, what kinds of reactions you study there. The difference between the heat capacity of a calorimeter and the specific heat of a substance and so forth. So uh, hopefully you can work on this. Now, you're not on your own. I am gonna post the solutions to all these problems later on. So by the time you turn it in, which is gonna be when you do your thermochemistry lab next week, you'll be able to see the solutions and answers and I'll let you check these by yourself, okay? So let me write these things down here again to make sure that we don't forget, all right? And uh, I'm not gonna put that one on because you guys have done that before. So I'm gonna put a different kind of activity that'll have more relevance to the stuff we're gonna be studying over the next couple of lectures. Like I said, all of these papers that I wrote, again, sorry for my scribbling, and sometimes I kind of forget how to frame it correctly here, but uh, the whiteboard function in my Zoom for some reason is not working, it doesn't open up. So I don't know if they took it out or something. Maybe the, the university thought it was dangerous or something. I don't know. But anyway, they took it out. Okay. So uh, that is as far as I'm going to go today. What we're going to do is we're going to take a break. And then if you want, uh, we will reconvene at 7. At that time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take questions about either the you have questions about the exam or questions about the lab that you are doing right now, the uh, group three and four analysis. Uh, that's what we're gonna discuss. Uh, I'm only gonna be around for about half an hour or so. So if you have any specific questions, please come ready to ask me specific questions, okay? If you have questions about the exam itself, like why did I get this wrong or how do you solve this problem? Uh, we're not gonna discuss that in the public room. So I'm gonna, uh, kind of like put you in a what's called a breakout room where you and I can talk privately because like I said, not everybody got the same questions in their exams. So it'd be very confusing to other people who were discussing uh, questions that they didn't have, okay? So uh, let me see, are there any questions about today's material? Any questions? You can unmute your microphone or you can put a message here in the chat. I'm going to give you a few seconds to do that. I know sometimes it takes a little bit of time to download, you know, like 
get things in there. I'm sorry. I'm making all these kind of faces here for some reason. Okay. Well, what we're going to do here is we are going to uh, stop the recording here and uh, we will reconvene if you want to join us at seven o'clock in a few minutes. Uh, if not, I will see you on Thursday. The connection information again will be posted in Canvas about half an hour before our meeting. Okay, so uh, hasta la vista. Have a great time and we'll stop the recording here.